Hello everyone and welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah and today I want to share with you a deck that's a newer acquisition. It is the Dreams of Pentagruel Oracle and it was created by another YouTuber, Sorsha, over at Sorsha's Soaring Craft. I will link to her channel and some videos that she's made about this deck um, in the description box below. I bought a copy of this deck in my mind as soon as Sorsha started talking about it and showing a couple of sample cards on her um, on her channel because this kind of medieval or early renaissance um, collection of weirdos type of art style really appeals to me these sort of fantastical humorous creatures um, have always really appealed to me they've appeared in you know, kind of as early as I can remember, things like um, the wacky children's literature that my mother used to read to me, the fantasy stories, um, things like the adventures of Baron von Munchausen, um, and any kind of surrealist or absurdist, humorous, fantastical stories. Um, even things like Alice in Wonderland, for example, um, contain uh, similar elements or similar kinds of humor to these types of images. So even though I had never heard of the book, um, the original book that these images are based on, um, or seen any of these specific images before, I was immediately connected with this kind of imagery and that's why I bought a copy. Um, I don't think that this deck is necessarily going to work for, it's certainly not going to work for everyone, it might not even work for very many people. Um, but I wanted to talk about why it works for me. I wanted to kind of show you um, some of the features of the deck that are a little bit subtle. I think this deck is quite subtle, actually. Um, quite subtle and quite bold at the same time, I guess. Um, but I wanted to talk about some of its more subtle features and then look at it with other decks and see how it might, might or might not play with other things in uh, my collection. So um, before I do all that, I did want to also point out that this is a, another recent find. I got this um, ammonite fossil. You can see the um, fossilized creature here, this kind of snail shape. And um, I got this at a recent uh, outing to a flea market um, for $2. And it perfectly matches the colors in the backs of the deck. So I just thought that was kind of a cool thing. I actually got it because of another deck that I will be um, able to show you later this summer, but it was fun to also visually see how it tied in with this kind of swirling pattern and, and the colors on the backs of these cards. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Sorsha has a couple of videos about her deck. She has a complete walkthrough on her channel as well as um, a description of what the actual source material is, um, its historic provenance, um, and some other important information about it. And rather than make a clumsy rehash of that information, I'm just going to point you to her source material. You can watch her walkthrough. You can see all of the cards. I'm not going to do a walkthrough today. I'm going to show you some of the images, but um, I'm not going to do a card by card. Um, this is 120 cards, so it's bigger than a normal uh, tarot deck. And I think what's, for me, more valuable than looking at the individual images, um, now that I have the deck in my hands, is, like I said, to look at some of the other features of the deck and to look at how the imagery generally compares um, or talks to other kinds of imagery. One of the videos I'm going to link below um, that I think you should watch regardless of whether this deck appeals to you is uh, another video that Sorsha made about this deck and how it relates to the works of Shel Silverstein. And Shel Silverstein is a, a children's poetry author. Um, he also wrote other things, but he wrote a lot of books of poetry for children that I grew up with, and I mentally would not have put those two things together, but it's amazing how well they do go together. Um, and then at the end of that video, after giving some uh, sort of pre-planned examples of this, Sorsha does a, a random bibliomancy reading, and I swear that thing still has me reeling. It's It kind of blew me away. Um, and I still kind of can't get over my surprise and amazement over that. So uh, do watch that video. If you watch nothing else that I link to on my, ch on my channel, just 
go watch it. It's it's really great. Um, and so, like I said, I want to talk about the features of this deck and then kind of how it functions as a deck. Um, so uh, the first thing I'll say is that visually, a lot of the deck is made to look like the original source material that's very intentional. So you have a linen finish on the cardstock. I'll try to hold it up to the light. You can see it there. And that's intentional. It mimics the look of laid paper um, or the kind of paper that would have been used in the original uh, publication of the book that these images come from. And they were originally published as a book, as an intentional collection of images. Um, the dreams of Pantagruel, the dreams of this particular fantastical giant. So they come out of a book and I appreciate how much like a book these cards appear. Um, because I think it really adds to the character of the deck. It adds an interesting dimension uh, when you have rather simple drawings, just these these line drawings or etchings. Something else that comes from the original book is the backs. So this swirling pattern that I was mentioning before, this is the marbled or, or a snippet of the marbled end papers from one of the editions of the book. So that's really cool. And in Sorsha's um, guidebook to this deck, um, which really just talks about the history and, and what the source material is. Again, it, it doesn't give uh, divinatory meanings for each card, which I think is good um, uh, that she refrained from doing that. Um, but it does talk about the, the source material. So she talks about the end papers, and then she also talks about um, the cover or the binding to one of the editions of this book and how it featured this color red. And so she has an image of the original book as well in her guidebook. So this red outline comes from that uh, color, I believe. Uh, the images are all numbered and they would not have been originally numbered, um, but they appear in the deck in the order that they appear in the book. So that was very intentional. And I think it's helpful to have numbers on a deck like this because if you want to refer back to something, you need a unique identifier for each card. And so numbering is a very simple way to do that um, and doesn't add a lot of uh, cultural or personal weight to the cards. Um, the way that assigning a name, for example, to each of these images um, or a keyword or something would do. Uh, so the structure of the deck is that it's numbered from one to 20. There's no other kind of structure imposed on this deck. and I appreciate that because if you've heard me talk about readings and um, and things before, you know that I like a very open structure so that the interpretation can happen in the moment of a reading. Something else that you'll notice is that the tone of the cards shifts. I think there's probably three or four different distinct um, colorations here that we're seeing. So it's it's. It's the coloration of the background. And I, I like that a lot. Um, I actually asked Sorsha about this, whether that was intentional. And she said it was, and I, I can understand why. If um, all of the cards had the same background, then it would feel very samey. It would feel more samey, I think, than it does Anyway, um, you know, some of these characters have similar features. For example, here you have uh, two, you know, two that have little things. Actually, all three of these have little things coming out of their headdress or out of their hat. Um, you know, there's lots of bodily fluids coming out of places. There's lots of uh, stiff members in the middle of bodies. There's, you know, there's a lot of um, funny hats. Um, or, you know, insects or things like that. So I think if you had ha also had all of the cards being the same tone, then it just wouldn't have had as much depth. And I think there's something interesting about light and dark um, tones that can give you a sense of distance from the cards. Uh, some darker cards at the top of my reading space. Okay. 
and then arrange some lighter colored cards below them, you can start to get the impression that those are further away and these are closer toward you. So you can play, you can actually use this feature a little bit depending on how you arrange the cards. Something else that is interesting and bookish about this deck is the inclusion or the, the lack of cleanup of some of the ghosting on the original images. So here you can see that while uh, Sorsha decided to remove a lot of the artifacts in the main part of the image, between the legs of this uh, creature, there is, are some horizontal and vertical lines here. It almost looks like brickwork or something, just very faintly there in the background. And you get that on a number of the images where you can see something, it would have been something on the opposing page or the reverse side of the page that the ink is showing through um, or staining is showing through in some way. And that not only t gives it a, a, a bookish quality as if you were flipping through um, a book with these designs on both sides, but it also gives you that sense of mystery or curiosity or something. Um, just another little element to tickle your imagination when you are laying these out. And so I think that's, you know, that's really cool. So that sort of sums up um, the book-like qualities of this deck. We have the, the difference in tone. So we have the sense of this older book where pages may be uh, more or less faded or more or less corroded or something like that. Um, we have the different colors and textures used in the original publication of the book. We have the linen finish. Um, and then we also have on a few cards these uh, registration marks. Um, there'll be just a little letter underneath, and this again is from the original source material. And this also gives uh, the work a, a bookish quality um, or brings in those bookish elements to this uh, collection in this format. I, I appreciate that Sorsha took the trouble to, to develop this deck because I think that um, it would be hard to work with this collection of images as a bound book. You could do it, um, but you know the images would always be in the same order. They would always be next to specific other images, and you wouldn't be able to mix them up like this or see how they talk to each other um, in different orders. And, uh, you know, also just a book is like big and clunky and you'd have to haul it around. Um, whereas this deck, even though it's kind of thick, um, it's on a nice, thin, flexible cardstock. And so this is something you could easily put into a bag and take with you. So that's about the, the deck itself or its like physical properties. Um, something else I wanted to talk about is Sorsha's choice in how she produced this deck is that she has them all uh, in a, in a, a framing or an arrangement where there's this horizontal line uh, underneath each character and then there's a little empty space here so um, you know I'm sure part of that is just the logistics of taking a, a less tall and skinny image and fitting it into a more tall and skinny uh, frame but I really like the way that that works here and I appreciate Sorsha's decision to kind of put some empty space at the bottom of each image rather than maybe scooching them all down and then having uh, the number separated more at the top. It reminds me of this idea in Pamela Coleman Smith's deck, um, though this is the Rider Waite Smith, of that the characters are on a stage. So you, you see that in tarot books. Um, I can't remember where I first read it, but a number of authors on tarot um, mention this is that you know there seems to be a, a platform or a, a foreground a stage that these characters are acting out a scene upon and it's not in all of the cards in the RWS but it's in quite a few of them and so I like this reference um, back to this tarot deck um, and this concept um, even in you know cards like this this three of cups uh, where there's more going on in the foreground, you you also get that in this deck. So something like this might be comparable. Um, but you get a sense um, 
that uh, these characters are being presented to you in this way. I think another deck, um, and I don't have a copy of this deck, but the Carnival at the End of the World, um, I have heard um, Colin over at Prism and Company talk about um, how the characters at the, the uh, Carnival at the End of the World deck are sort of mounted on a little chunk of their environment. And these guys uh, certainly look like that. Um, Sorsha and I were chatting and it's it's almost as if they're like the little green army men that are stuck onto their little, um, you know, piece of turf it's because, you know, the little green plastic army men would fall over. They wouldn't be able to stand up on their own with their small feet. So they have to be mounted onto a chunk of their environment in order to be upright. And these guys, um, you know, that seems to be true here as well. So it also gives you a sense of setting, even if it's just a small amount of dirt or ground or something that they're standing on, um, you can still get a sense of where where these characters might be. So I like I like this a lot. I feel like this blank space also serves as an invitation um, to you know caption this or to give each of these characters a name. And while I wouldn't want them to have permanent names or keywords or captions, I think within a reading, uh, visually, this is an invitation to maybe add in a little slogan or adjective or, you know, emotion or name for these characters that could be interesting um, just to do as part of your reading, reading uh, session. All of these things together, you know, the, the texture of the cards, the shading, um, the blank space, you know, the organization, all of it is very subtle. But I think all together it gives this deck a depth and a richness that's a little hard to achieve in a, in a fairly simplistic deck. Now the, the drawings are quite detailed. You get a lot of texture and shading. The, the line work is very fine. Um, and I'm calling them etchings, uh, not really knowing exactly if that's a right term, but they looked they look like other etchings that I've seen from similar time periods, so I don't know if that's quite right. Um, I did want to compare this deck to others in my collection that might be similar, um, and then I'm going to show them paired with other decks that you know they may or may not pair well with, but we'll we'll check that out together. So one of those is the Bats Blood Ink Oracle by Monica Burdersky. Um, this is the only deck that I have that's that's really quite similar to this one in terms of the way it's presented. So like these guys, you have a um, just a black and white images. They're all numbered, and they're all little characters. And I like this deck for the same reason. I like the Pentecoral Oracle. Um, it's comical. It's sort of cute at times, but it's also very weird and surreal. Um, and it kind of tickles my imagination in an interesting way. And this one's, you know, a little bit, I would say, more cutesy. Monica has her own style, of course, as an artist, so which is different from from these from these images. And I would say these are are both also kind of cute and kind of spooky, um, but they have a different flavor from each other. That's one comparison I wanted to make. And then in thinking about how this deck works and what its aesthetics are, um, I also thought of the Yokai Yoshi Tarot. Unfortunately, this deck is out of print, and uh, I'm not sure it's ever going to be reprinted, so I don't know that it would be very easy to get a copy of it. Um, but that's not why I'm showing it to you. I'm showing it to you because um, the colors, and then just the fact that this is also a character deck. So Yokai are spirits uh, from the Shinto philosophy or worldview. It's not quite a religion, uh, I don't think, but... It is a, a cultural belief system in Japan. And again, we have uh, these creatures that look, you know, in some ways human, perhaps some of them do, um, but then many of them don't. And they're just very interesting to look at and uh, consider 
up against these guys. So I liked the opportunity to kind of think about this. You know, some of them are maybe almost familiar as uh, actual creatures and then others less so. But I think it's kind of cool the way these these talk to each other. This is a tarot deck. It's got all the suits and everything. And then this is just, you know, like I said, 120 oracle cards. Um, so they function a little bit differently, but aesthetically, I think they're kind of similar in an interesting way. Before we look at other decks that uh, this may or may not go with, one more thought about um, these characters is that they're mostly in costume. So they're not entirely showing us who they really are. They have these cumbersome uh, accoutrements. Many of their faces are covered. You know, their bodies are, are often swamped by very large, um, cumbersome um, costumes or objects. So, you know, we can see this guy's face, um, but we can't really see this face. We can see a beak coming out. Um, we don't know very much at all about what's happening here. Um, this looks like, you know, someone is trapped inside this steaming pie, and I don't know if that's their face sort of breaking through the, the pie crust, or if it's an expression of, you know, angst and, and anger, um, almost as if the pie crust were a mask on their face. It's, it's just hard to know, and maybe, you know, it dep again, depends on the situation in the reading. And again, here, um, you know, this arm is sticking out from underneath this enclosure. And then there's a face way down here in what would be the abdomen of this creature. This is sort of reminds me of the old fashioned devil card with the face in the belly. But I can't tell if that face is actually connected to this body. Or again, if this is a mask that's part of a costume. So it, it raises uh, a lot of questions when you're reading with this deck is, you know, who are, who are these creatures really? Um, who are they on the inside? Uh, what's their true nature? What are they projecting? What are they uh, pretending to be? Um, what role are they playing in public or, or you know, in this reading or in this, um, in this society of little weird creatures <laughs> that they are a part of? I don't know. Um, it just raises a lot of interesting questions for me. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that a lot. Um, I think it's relatively unique. Um, the Monaco Bodersky deck does have a few characters that are that are clearly in costume, but um, in this one, it seems to be the predominant factor. Um, you know, or they or are they not costumes, um, but they're actually extensions uh, or amalgamations? Are these a bunch of little like Franken people or Franken creatures? Um, that are stitched together. I, I call them costumes because a lot of times there are things like, uh, on this guy, for example, you know, he's got this like series of buttons or, or snaps, and then like the back of him is not in the costume. So um, you do get the sense, or at least I get the sense that a lot of this is an attached um, thing or something that's, that's surrounding their real body. But maybe or maybe not, I don't know. This, this could be, um, a creature that has an eye and a mouth here and a long snout and then some sort of thick leathery skin that comes down only part way to cover their body. Who knows? Um, it appears that they're wearing shoes uh, here, but maybe that's a growth on the back of their feet. I don't know. So um, anyway, that's just something else to think about. You know, what are they, what is their costume? What props are they wearing or carrying with them? Uh, what is their environment? And then what is what are they doing? And that's another way I want to work with this deck. Um, I appreciate that Sorsha doesn't dictate how this deck is to be used. There's no system and there's no sort of direct intention behind uh, what the cards are for. Um, so she gives you some, you know, suggestions and some examples um, in her videos and her guidebook, but really they can be used for anything. And I guess that leads me on to my next um, topic, which is, 
you know, in a reading by itself, I would use this as probably a series of actions or a series of steps to take. Um, I would probably ask the deck those kinds of questions or use it for those kinds of inquiries. You know, what can I do about this situation um, and read it like that. Um, but I could also see calling it back to another uh, reading with another deck. So let me get another deck out. I have a couple of suspects that I think will go well and a couple that I'm not really sure about so that I wanted to try out. So let's take a look at those. So the first deck I wanted to try is the Tremfi del Luna. Um, this is from Patrick Valenza, Deviant Moon Incorporated. And this deck is, it's a modern version of an ancient Italian style. Um, it's not based on a specific deck, so it's not an, a, a recreation of a specific deck but it, it draws its heart and soul from old Italian decks. So this deck really reminds me of the fantastical and slightly spooky um, sense of humor of things like Tim Burton movies, especially things like Beetlejuice or Edward Scissorhands or um, things like Alice in Wonderland or um, the Terry Gilliam movies, um, for example, The Adventures of Baron von Munchausen. So if we look at it through that um, lens, which I really do think Patrick Valenza has, you know, his sense of humor grows out of this kind of spooky, um, sp spooky but playful um, sensibility. Uh, then if you start pairing things up, you know, then you kind of, you can see that um, unfolding. And so what I might do is just do a reading with three cards. And then once I have a sense of that reading, um, shuffle this deck and say, okay, what can I do about that? What's my next step? Or how can I approach the situation that's outlined in these cards and just draw a single card to kind of um, give me some advice or some, uh, some kind of a next step to take. So I think that, um, I think these do look good together. Let's try another combination of cards here. I'm just going to kind of go random. Um, might be somewhat in order. No, they're shuffled. Okay, so if we do something like this, and then draw another oracle card, you know, I don't know what the question is. I don't know what the advice is. I'm not going to do this reading for you, but you could pause the video and think of a question and then uh, see how this would read for you. I like that uh, when the characters are looking to the left, like this one was, um, you know, it looks like they're directly reacting to this reading. Like, oh god, you've got some terrible cards, or... Oh, I, I kind of like this. Let's, let's go with the flow of this. You know, this guy looks kind of amused and happy. Let's try one more. Yeah, I think that works. All right, so that's a cool effect. I dig that. Um, let's try a more modern deck. So I also have with me uh, the Fifth Spirit Tarot. And I drew this one specifically for the aesthetics. So this is like a beige on beige kind of a deck. It's a fairly uh, muted color palette. It has some color in it, but it's you know fairly soft. And that's interesting. So yeah, this is this is interesting. Mr. Rogers' Descent into Hell? No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this is just kind of fun to experiment and see. See what you get. But I like this. I think it works. Okay, so it works with the Fifth Spirit, works with the Triumphi Del Luna. Right, so let, we tried a desaturated deck, let's try a saturated deck next. This is Terror of the Sweet Twilight. It's one of my Surrealist decks. 
Um, this is a modern one. Uh, the artwork is by Christina Benintende, and it is produced by Los Garabeo. And it features more and less surrealist artwork. So some of the some of the cards are a little bit sweet, and a little bit sort of childlike, or um, yeah, childlike, fantastical, that kind of thing. But then you get some imagery that is a little weirder. A little bit more like, again, like Beetlejuice or Edward Scissorhands or The Nightmare Before Christmas. That would be another deck, actually, that might work well with this, but I think this will do fine for comparison. So this is kind of fun. I like uh, the rhyme here. Her face and this face sort of look similar in this layout. So you get some interesting combinations. And it's fun to pair things out of time. I think that's one of the things that um, really impressed me when Sorsha did her video about um, the Dreams of Pentagoral deck and then reading the Shel Silverstein poetry with it. It's like, how do two things that were made 400 years apart speak to each other? How do they resonate? How do they actually work? Um, and it's amazing to see that um, happening in real time because you think, I don't know, I, th I think it's often um, easy to feel disconnected from history, but when you can see um, historical imagery tying back with something from the modern world, I don't know, it just, it sort of gives me like a happy feeling, like, okay, maybe things are, you know, th all things are connected and, and maybe I do have a place, even if I'm not sure what that is. There is a unifying sense to time and history and culture. Yeah, I like this a lot, the way these two go together, and I wasn't sure about that, but I dig it. I think it, it's helpful that um, some of the creatures we've been getting have had expressions on their faces. So again, I'm reading these expressions and looking at the expressions on these faces too. All right, so that's Tarot of the Tw Sweet Twilight with the Dreams of Pentagoral Oracle. And I want to look at one more. Um, I have my doubts about this one, but I'm open to being surprised. This is the Spanish Tarot produced by Fournier, and it is a very brightly colored, almost garishly colored, but yeah, it has intense colors. It's very spring-summer, very lively, um, but I was curious to see if it would work with this deck. I don't know. Again, one thing that this deck has, the um, Spanish Tarot has going for it, is that this, the faces are quite expressive. So you get uh, the characters kind of talking to each other through body language and eye line and that. And I think maybe with some of these cards, we can see some reflections going on, perhaps. So like even, you know, her head position and hat shape and this head position and hat shape. Um, I don't know, what do you think? Does this work? Is this too weird? All right, well, on this slightly uh, strange tableau, I will just say thank you for joining me for this exploration of the Dreams of Pentagoral Oracle by Sorsha Soringcraft. If you're interested in getting this deck, again, it is available on Make Playing Cards. I'm, I'm not advocating that you should buy this, but uh, I do want to let people know in case they're interested. I haven't seen anything that's quite like this, um, so I appreciate it for its uniqueness uh, in that sense as well. Um, thank you to Sorsha for all her hard work to bring this to us. And until next time, be well, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.